Yeah, thank you so much, Martha, and thank you to the team for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here and really happy to be talking to an international audience. Um, I can't see you all and I can't see where, you're, where, you, where you all are, but I know that we have people from um, across the world in different time zones. So good morning to people who are, who are in Scotland and good afternoon to people who are, who are, who are in various places in Malaysia um, and Dubai. So welcome to everybody. As Martha said, I want to talk today about um, international and transnational communities and how we maintain those, how we sustain those um, in, into the future and, 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 and particularly in the current circumstances where we have such disrupted communities and disrupted social interaction. These, this poses huge challenges for us. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk about the institutional, the political um, and particularly the interpersonal levels of international communities and transnational communities. Um, and I, I want to also focus on curriculum today too. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour from the top down to the curriculum. Um, and um, I hope that, um, that, that, that some of the ideas I raise will be, will have some resonances with, um, with your, your working contexts and, and where you are. So I'm going to talk um, a little bit about um, the crisis that we're in and how this is kind of um, shone really, really shone a spotlight on international collaboration and, and generated a need to rethink internationalization. Um, and I want to talk about how we can sustain those communities, how we because th these transnational learning communities are going to be key to the quality and sustainability of higher education as we go forward into this decade. Um, and um, I want to talk a little bit about the futures of institutional relationships, but also looking forward as well as looking back um, and, and talking about how important it is to think about our, our socio-cultural histories and pasts um, in, when we think about communities and collaboration. And then finally, I want to talk in a bit of depth about um, classroom learning communities and how we generate these um, uh, as, as we work together. So it, the, the, the current situation that we find ourselves in, where, where, we've gener where, where the pandemic has generated physical immobility, has really highlighted some of the things, um, some un un really unsustainable practices around internationalisation. Now that we can't physically jet off and see each other and, and, uh, and engage at that level. We've really had to think about what is important in our collaboration, what is important in our international collaboration. Um, and, and I think this, as well as obviously the, 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 the very, very negative and tragic consequences of the pandemic, this has also generated some, some points that we can think about in internationalization. Um, and, um, and, and think about what was missing before in a situation where, where we had, you know, a lot of um, neoliberal and measurement focuses that were generating certain types of internationalization, perhaps some over -inst institutionalized practices and, and disconnections between communities and strategic agendas of universities. So universities pushing forward and, and sometimes not bringing whole communities with us. So, um, you know, and, and this has sometimes meant that internationalization has been a, a, a bit disconnected, has, has felt disconnections. Um, and certainly I, I think that in, in the UK, um, because we've been in a crisis situation, um, there has been, um, universities have had to make quite a lot of decisions very quickly, very rapidly, and this has generated perhaps less sectoral unity and less sectoral, uh, a, a lack of unity across universities where, where there could have been collaboration, that there's perhaps been more of a kind of, uh, a kind of crisis response and universities have responded individually. So how can we, at, at this point, how can we really rethink what, what, what community means internationally and, and how can we make sure that, that, that we're moving forward together? I think if you think about um, internationalization and international collaboration as a personal relationship, 
then it starts to perhaps raise some raise some important issues because um, we're, we're, we're thinking of um, we want to foster partnerships. Perhaps we should go a little bit further in our in, in our thinking about these collaborations between institutions being very similar or a, a metaphor for interpersonal relationships. So um, quite often we find that actually the best collaborations are built on personal relationships between academics who actually like each other, who have who, who are friends and who have built friendship over time. And actually that's where internationalization quite often has its best successes and has, has its most sustainable partnerships. So thinking about um, thinking about international collaboration between institutions as relationships is quite important, I think. Because th these these are um, these are very complex communities. We have the, the, the transnational communities of the sort that, that Harriet Water have have developed are, are, are very complex. Um, and you know, it, it's it's not just staff communities of staff with staff, it's students with each other, it's students with staff, and um, institutions are all there in the mix. Um, so so I think it's it's really important to see these to see the complexity of these relationships and try to kind of unpick a little bit how how these can be sustained. I mean, for transnational education, where where flying faculty um, have traditionally where it's been, you know, some members of staff flying out to other countries at the moment, obviously that is, you know, is not it's not possible. So. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're relying on online interaction and that is qualitatively different um, to to face-to-face to, to -face personal interaction. So there's risk in these in these current circumstances for our communities. So I think there's three areas where where we can think about these these interpersonal relationships and and where universities where, where this kind of um, rethinking of internationalization is possible. Um, so um, I think universities in their push for strategic agendas and, and push for kind of collaboration and to compete, they often fail to, re to recognize that international collaboration is about groups of academics working together. And, uh, and, there's the, and, and, and if that is not kind of put at the forefront then there's a risk that that internationalization break down. Um, second area is that universities quite often forget that um, what's gone before is really really important. So so the strongest sustained sustained international communities are built on history. That they're, they're built on history of interactions. That they're built on. Um, quite often built on institutions, historical and cultural past. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and also when we're in a situation like this, in a pandemic like this, we, we really have, there is a risk, as I said before, about, you know, sectors responding or universities responding individually, um, where agendas might become misaligned. Because obviously, again, where where internationalization works best is where where two institutions or two universities agendas mesh really well together and, and there's a feeling of community and shared purpose um, but there's a risk to that in the current situation because um, where where political or um, economic um, challenges um, exist then there's a risk to a misalignment of these so I think this is these are the three areas that we need to really think about um, so I'm just going to say a little bit about each one of those briefly. Um, so I think the most important one, I'm going to come back to this um, a, a couple of times in, in what I'm saying, is trust and value of the local. And I mean, if you've if you've read into internationalization, if you've read about international um, internationalization in higher education, you'll know that this is dichotomy, this tension between what's happening locally and what's happening globally. Um, and these these relationships between the local and global are really really important. So um, so in this situation, we really do need to think about what's happening locally in in the communities that we're engaging with 
um, uh, internationally. Um, and I think it, even again, what I was saying about you know this this pandemic generating a rethink of what um, of what internationalisation means. I think universities have not trusted local communities and local partners enough in the past, and this is the time to be thinking about this. So, who do we have in a local context abroad? What are those communities doing, and how can we kind of um, uh, put the put the institution's trust into into what's happening there. So um, so for example, if you, if if we have um, uh, staff who are employed by our institutions who are working in other contexts, this is this is like gold dust to us now. Um, in, at Durham, we have a, we have a system called Associate Professors in Practice, and these are um, representatives of the university or people who have been given honorary positions. Who are working in professional contexts, and and that's where our that's where we've got opportunities, and that's where there's a potential for trust. Um, so this is really important. I think both transnational and international co collaboration are, as I said before, are often built on historical and cultural pasts, and those those are where the most successful partnerships are, where there's decades of activity and decades and a long history of, of interaction between institutions and groups of people. This is the time to be looking at where universities ha already have those interactions. Because we can't jet off and make new relationships, we have to think about the relationships that we've already got um, with, with and where are our most sustained relationships and where are our most um, long-standing relationships in other countries. Because again, these are really important to us at the moment um, and really should have been more important to us before. Because um, your oldest friends are, are sometimes your best friends. Um, so uh, just as an example, Xiamen University in China um, established this um, fantastic new campus in Malaysia in 2015. It was China's first transnational campus. It opened with small number of students and has developed really, really quickly. But that that um, that idea to build this campus in Malaysia was didn't come out of the blue because Xiamen University, um, where where Xiamen is is in China. It's geographically positioned um, in in really good contact with with um, Malaysia, where it is on the southeast south um, southeast coast of China, and also Xiamen City itself has a very long history of working with Malaysia. It has a big Malaysian community in Xiamen and actually the founder of Xiamen University was Malaysian. Um, uh, and, and so this is the, these sorts of relationships and where this works best, these things are not plucked out of the air. They're, they're based on, um, you know, histories and cultural histories of cities, not and cities where universities exist. You know, these geographic and cultural pasts are hugely important partnerships and and this tells us that actually this is about community it's about communities it's not just about um you know league tables and choosing the right the right university so i think the, the main thing is that we have to find a sense of kind of global community we have to sense find a sense of this common purpose so that we can kind of um develop this shared understanding of the benefits and the affordances of internationalization across countries and build it on this kind of on this on these histories and on these pasts. Um, there's just to be idealistic for one moment, um, this idea of the of a world society, um, again, an idealistic one, but one that we can consider particularly in, in the current circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, I mean, internationalization has, has too long remained a national um, issue. So even though you're talking about being international as a university, what you're thinking about is the is the benefits to your national system and benefits to your to, to your na your university in a national context. Um, so we need to kind of rethink this. And there's some prophetic prophetic words there from Babones and Aberg, which were written before the pandemic started. Um, and saying in the 21st century, the technical feasibility of world society, if not assured, already assured, soon will be. So we have that technical possibility, but how are we going to really make that 
into these shared ideas and shared and common purposes. So this sense of common interests, sense of common values, um, that's what we need to be thinking about. And that's what we need to be building our institutions on, building our international communities on. So just turning to Harriet Watt for a moment, because um, uh, I think um, what Martha said at the beginning of this lecture is really, really important. Harriet Watt is, is constructing itself as a global university, and it is a global university. It has um, campuses in Malaysia, campuses in Dubai, campuses in different parts of Scotland. Um, so what does this mean in terms of senses of belonging and senses of community? Uh, because, you know, as, as this is a quote from Harriet Watts um, uh, st strategy, internationalization and, 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 and strategy, uh, you know, one third of the pro of the students on Scottish campuses are from outside the UK and 60 percent of the students are on non-Scottish campus programmes, so spread all over the world. So what, what does that mean for community and for a sense of belonging? Um, it's important to, 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 to ask this, um, because just being there is not, is not enough to, 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 to generate that kind of internationalism that, that we're talking about. Um, so I think we need to really think in detail about this kind of idea of the, like, the local and the global. And again, this kind of quote from Helda McGrew in 2000 is really interesting because we read these quotes, but until we've found ourselves in this global pandemic, sometimes we haven't actually, I don't think we've internalised these ideas. Um, you know, distant occurrences and developments can come to have serious domestic impacts. That really rings true at the moment, doesn't it? And local happenings can engender significant global repercussions. I mean, if you think about it in the context of the pandemic, that is so um, important. And educational institutions are part of that. And we're part of that kind of really at the centre of that, if we're part of the process because of our role in generating knowledge and understandings. I mean, it, it, it's really interesting, isn't it, that um, that when we've needed um, the, the, the vaccines against COVID, some of these quite a lot of these have come from interactions between universities and um, and you know pharmaceutical companies and so the role of research there really again and the role of knowledge and the sharing of knowledge across different universities global is, globally is how we've kind of managed to develop these vaccines at super quick times so you know it all of these things start to kind of you know make these ideas make sense in a lot of ways <clears throat> Just to, to make sure you're all still here, I thought some pictures of the beach would be quite nice at the moment, but as we're in winter in the UK. Um, and um, again, students who are in Orkney, how, how, much, how, how much sort of sense of belonging do students who are in Orkney feel towards Harriet Watt? How, how are they engaged in the communities of the university? And, and are they... Um, are that, do you, would you count those as local? Would we see look, Orkney as a local community? Or, you know, obviously there's a Malaysian beach there. Is Malaysia, a, would, would, how would we generate the kind of sense of local, sense of belonging in Malaysia and, and the complexity of that and Dubai the same? Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, a, a comment come up there, missing, missing traveling to Dubai and Malaysia and yeah, I, I th I know that makes us all feel really um, uh, nostalgic about going to the beach, really beautiful places there. And, the, and any any ideas which one's which, they, they look, you know, the, the sea's blue everywhere, the sand's beautiful everywhere, but one of them is Orkney, one of them's Dubai, and one of them's Malaysia. Um, but yeah, I mean, the sense of feelings of belonging, you know, wherever you are. I mean, it's possible that students in Orkney feel more... Um, more uh, um, isolated from the institution of Harriet Watt than students in Dubai. You know, maybe students in Dubai feel more of a sense of belonging. It doesn't matter where you are, it's that sense of community that's important and how we generate that. So yeah, just, to, just raising, this is a really interesting and useful paper, which is it's based on 
um, international development. Um, but it's this idea of, I, I think this idea is really important, as local as possible, as international as necessary, because obviously this is about um, this is about thinking about what is happening locally, is also about val valuing local knowledge. Um, so, you know, not kind of um, focusing knowledge and curriculum on a kind of imagined Western place. It's got to be, you know, you've got to have those that local knowledge. And I think this is really an interesting idea, this as local as possible and as international as necessary. We need both of those things. In, in the mix and, and and as I kind of move on, I think it might elaborate a little bit on that. So things are changing, you know, the pandemic is, is with us, but there's also a lot of very important movements to change curriculum afoot. Um, global protests against racism, um, you know, strong pressure to allow space and education for less Western and less Eurocentric lines of exploration and knowledge. Um, and some of this has been generated from from student activity in in South Africa. Again, we're seeing the the, the repercussions of of um, of local versus global in our international communities. And this has generated discussion back in the UK. This is a statue of um, Cecil Rhodes, um, and um, you know that lots of debates around how we can kind of decolonize our universities and acknowledge these these colonial pasts are very important and, and, and very important movements. Um, and these are generating movements within the university which are parallel to internationalization. So the decolonizing agendas in university are crucial and to, to rethinking our positions on internationalization. We need more kind of um, interactive participatory approaches. Um, really important initiatives here. Um, we need decolonizing and decentering approaches. You know, in, in the past, an engagement with the global south has been one sided. Um, you know, we, we need to, to rethink the way that we engage with with um, with, with our um, with, with our with our international partners and all, all of this stuff about the local and the global interacts with these ideas of decolonizing, decentering approaches. Um, so these intersections are really crucially important um, because if we're going to have positive, high quality education, this and, and if there's going to be educational reform, if we're going to rethink internationalization, all of these things must um, articulate together. And this is a, a quote from Leon Tickley, um, uh, um, who talks about the struggles for change have to be at a global, regional, national and local levels. You know, if you miss any of these levels out, um, you know, true change and true rethink of, inter of education is going to be very challenging. So just to, to move now to thinking about curricula now, I'm, I'm kind of conscious of, of, of time um, and I want to make sure that I, I, I don't go over 40 minutes. So but now I'm going to talk a little bit about curriculum and how we kind of how do we work all of those ideas that I've just been talking about? How do we work them down into curriculum? How do we work them down into our interactions with students in the classroom? Um, uh, I'm a huge fan of Raywan Connell's work. I won't go into it now, but it's think these these southern southern curriculum, southern perspectives on on knowledge. If you're interested, you could follow follow these ideas up. So I want to talk about two areas. I want to talk about dialogic education and how dialogue and education is really important and getting a dialogic space. So again, this is kind of a bit of educational theory that you may be interested in, you may be interested in following up, but the idea is really that um, in the classroom, in the classroom discourses, there has to be space for other voices to, to avoid one dominant discourse, to avoid one dominant voice coming through. There has to be dialogic practices that, uh, that allow space for other voices to come in. And this is talking about voices from the local, voices from the global south. How can we integrate those into, into, our, into our classrooms? So, um, you know, I, I did quite a lot of work with um, Manuel, um, Juan Manuel Fernandez Cardenas from, from a Mexican university, and he's uh, writing about how two or more voices can express themselves without trying to silence each other. This is what we're aiming for. 
Um, and, you know, this pluricultural context and dialogue in a pluricultural context where, um, where we break down hierarchies in the classroom and dialogue breaks down hierarchies, um, you know, creating con conditions for the coexistence of, of, of different voices. Um, and thinking in dialogue as thinking devices, this is all this educational theory along along dialogue. So we, we, we how can we kind of um, extend co-constructive approaches to education can make these spaces for other voices to come th to come through. So where we construct knowledge in the classroom together, not positioning knowledge as um, as um, absolute or, you know, as, as a kind of finite thing. It's where knowledge is co-constructed with different different perspectives. It, it, this is where the spaces can be can be made. <clears throat> so just um, this is kind of a little bit of a, a travel through some some work that I've done in the past, and I just want to raise something, a, a piece of work that I did with um, Val Clifford from Australia. Um, and um, in 2014, where we looked at, um, we analysed um, teachers' contributions in a wholly in a fully online course um, that we'd run on internationalisation of the curriculum. And, we, and we've written a couple of papers around this. This one's from 2014. There was another one in 2017, where we analysed um, digital contributions of teachers and I won't go into this I mean if you're interested you can follow it up but it just I just want to raise a few things that people the teachers in those contexts raised which I think are incredibly important when we think about sustaining communities and sustaining um, uh, communities at transnational and international communities so what we did find was that teachers were quite idealistic and radical about what they felt um, they wanted to achieve with their students and they saw education as a kind of way of empowering students to become agents of change um, develop their kind of uh, very importantly developing an awareness of, of themselves and their own strengths and their own prejudice um, was important um, and, and students role in deciding what should be learned how it's learned and how it should be assessed and again we're starting to i'm starting to that you can see how this might relate to this idea of dialogic education and relate back to that. Um, teachers felt that university education should be transformative. You know, at the political level, some saw the ultimate goal as, as, as students becoming active global citizens. And you'd be you'd be familiar with these ideas, I think, of global citizenship and also the the, the, the criticisms of those ideas, too. Um, so these quite idealistic about education, higher education's role in, in generating social justice, equality, social responsibility. Um, you know, and this, uh, uh, these are quotes from the from the data that we gathered. Where else would 21st century graduates learn about this, if not at university, where we should be, you know, generate enforcing their sense of ethical values. <clears throat> um, student teacher relationships very important i'm going to skip over that because i'm aware that i want to um make sure i get to the end <clears throat> this is really important positionality of teachers <clears throat> about how um how important it is to, to to question your own positions um and and and, and what the role of the teacher is in, in in the classroom and in generating these positive learning communities and I think this is really crucial. Before we start to engage with our communities and with our international teachers have to change. Teachers have to, there has to be personal change, has to be, you know, personal transformation of the teacher before engagement with the students so that we know what, we know what filters we're bringing ourselves into these interactions with students in the classroom. Um, and, and, and the course that we did encouraged that. But I think um, what, an, another quote that I'm quite fond of from that data is, is that, you know, obviously we, we need to influence change, we need to be transformative, but what about the institutions that we work in? You know, some of our institutions are set, or quote this teacher, set up for an age long gone. Um, you know, wh whereas if we're trying to challenge paradigms, trying to build new forms of knowledge, then, you know, we need to be thinking about dynamic institutions and how those how those can be, um, how, how institutions can change um, 
And we've seen in the current pandemic that institutions can change and they can change quickly. Um, but, you know, how, how can we guide that change forward um, to make sure that it's kind of getting down into the curriculum? I want to, I've just got a few minutes left and I just want to introduce a framework to you, which has been really important in my way of thinking about internationalization of the curriculum and change at, at a curriculum level. And this is um, Kitano, um, Kitano's and Mori's also picked up by Mori later, a, a framework of exclusive, inclusive and transformed levels of multicultural curriculum change. And, and actually, if you take if you look at Maury's um, paper and there's a reference in there's references at the end where you can find these. And if you can't find the paper, do let me know um, and I can I can send you a link to it. Um, it's a table which really sort of changed my way of thinking um, because it really made it clear where we can position ourselves, where we can position our curric ourselves in terms of what we're doing in the curriculum. And this table has three parts. It has a, a, an exclusive, where what the, they call exclusive curriculum, inclusive curriculum, and transformed curriculum. So, just as an exclusive cur tr curriculum. And, and the interesting thing about this table is it's got down the side content, instructional strategies, and activities, assessment of student knowledge, and classroom dynamics. And across the whole table, you can see what these different sorts of curriculum might look like. Um, so an exclusive curriculum is very traditional, mainstream um, experiences and perspectives, very transmission focused lecture and didactic mo models of teaching, question and answer sessions, a teacher is the purveyor of knowledge, it's exams and essays, and you know, focuses exclusively on content and avoidance of social issues. Obviously we wouldn't position our, want to position ourselves as having that sort of curriculum. Um, and then in the centre of the table, there's an inclusive curriculum. Again, the same things down the out, down the left hand side with content and assessment and so on. And this is I think this is where most people could position themselves in terms of their curriculum, trying to add alternative perspectives, different readings, analysing historical exclusion. The teacher is a purveyor of knowledge, but tries to engage students in critical thinking, encourages peer learning multiple methods of assessment <clears throat> and then acknowledgement of social issues. I think this is probably where where most people are in their curriculum. But I think what what is really important about this table is the third aspect of that, the transformative level, because that really goes quite a long way further um, and talks about transformative learning and transformative um, forms of curriculum. And you can see here that it's about reconceptualizing content, content, a complete paradigm shift, different way of thinking from a non-dominant perspective, changes in power structures so that teachers and learn it, students are learning together, um, and um, alternative forms of assessment, action-oriented projects, self-assessment reflections on course. And, and overall, the idea is to challenging biased views and sharing of diverse perspectives and equity in participation. So these are things that quite often, I think, in our curriculum and in our interactions, we're aspiring to rather than reaching. And I think in terms of building communities, these are the sorts of positions, these are the sorts of places that we need to take ourselves in, in our curriculum if we're going to sustain these really important interactions into the future. Um, and um, I've just got one more um, thing to say. I want to finish on a positive note because this is a new year lecture and we're, we're looking forward and um, hoping that, you know, the future is going to be um, positive. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, that just to finish with a with a Paolo Freire quote, obviously, I'm sure you're uh, many of you will be familiar with Paolo Freire's work and he talks about education as hope and eman emancipation. I mean, it's, his ideas are radical um, and and he talks about um, there being no such thing as neutral education. Education either functions as an instrument to bring about conformity or freedom. And, and actually, again, this kind of this is a thread that's been running through what I've been saying in these communities. We have to think about 
um, our positions as teachers, our positions as educators, our interpersonal relationships in internationalisation. Um, and, um, you know, but, but we also have to stay positive and think about education as hope and education as, um, as, as emancipation and transformation.